Most bloggers don't know how to make videos about Bangkok. They don't know the city. My goal is to tell them through your channel that Bangkok is a very interesting city with a very rich culture and very curious neighborhoods. This is what we'll explore today. Thailand is a country of wonders and its capital is Bangkok. It has it all from strange soups. Wow, it's a soup from bird saliva to a juice that not one of you have ever tried. It's a pork juice? From toilets in the middle of cafes, it smells like Russian trains after a week's travel. To the most fashionable trousers. Wow, what a luxury. I'm the tallest and most beautiful at this party. The city of angels, the great city, the eternal jewel city, the impregnable city of God Indra, the grand capital of the world endowed with nine precious gems, the happy city, abounding in an enormous royal palace that resembles the heavenly abode where reigns the incarnated God, a city given by Indra and built by Vishnu Karma. This is the full name of the capital of Thailand and Thai. Its official name is Krung Thep, but the world knows it as Bangkok. There was once a port serving the ancient Thai capital of Ayutthaya. It was destroyed by the Burmese in the 18th century and Bangkok became the capital. Now more than 10 million people live here and Bangkok is world famous for its nightlife and things forbidden elsewhere. Tourists come here to see the Buddhist pagodas, stroll along Kaozen Road and go on holiday to the islands. But I have decided to get to know the real Bangkok and Anton Dryanikin, a local resident, is here to help me. I'm 38 years old. I lived here for 14 years. I used to be a journalist. I photographed rock bands, Deep Purple, Nazareth. I followed them on their concert tours, talked to people in the industry a lot. I saw everyone except Mick Jagger, and I got bored. I hitchhiked because I had to move between cities. I met a lot of locals. Then I hitchhiked to Afghanistan. I was 22 years old, and then I hitchhiked to China. I went all over China. I visited Laos, and I always stay with the locals. I don't like nature. I like society. I ended up going all the way to Thailand, slaughtering pigs here planting rice. I came to the sea, pitched a tent, and got a fever. I was lying there completely oblivious for about five days. I had a fever of over 40 degrees Celsius. I almost died. Someone found me and brought me water, so I survived. Then, I was in Pattaya, recovering, for two months at a friend's house. I found a job in a travel agency and earned some money. There was no point on going home and spending it there, so I decided to invest it. I started to learn Thai. Now, I am a translator, make arrangements for tourists, and show people non-touristy places. The first thing we will do is to go to Chinatown. Just as we cross the canal, we see the Chinese characters, the traditional roofs. That's how we know we're in Chinatown. It's like a separate state in Bangkok. All the money in Thailand is there because the Chinese own 80% of it. The Thai Chinese don't know Chinese. They haven't been to China, but they have Thai names and everything is Thai, but they think like the Chinese. They even have motivational books, building business like the Chinese, think like the Chinese, Chinese sayings. Look, here's the main street in Chinatown. This is the place everyone films. In Thailand, there are three forces, the royal family, the army, and the Chinese businessmen. And these three main pillars stabilize the country. This is where all the factories are based. The factory itself may be in the north, but the headquarters are here. Because this is where the head of a Chinese Thai is. The king visits during Chinese New Year, so you can see the royal family right here. Have you tried roasted chestnuts? Yes, of course, but you've probably tried the ones fried in a pan. These are fried on small stones. They're very hot and there's a fire underneath. It's a completely different taste. The ones you've tried, we've compared them. White strawberries, expensive Japanese white strawberries. Do you want some? They're $60. No, not for $60. What's a Chinatown without a market with authentic Chinese stuff? I'm going to tell you a little bit about what they have here. In Russia, they have a salad with asparagus, with some white stuff. It's actually not asparagus, it's tofu. Soy milk foam, but a different kind. And this is ginkgo biloba, the Chinese pistachio. There's fish swim bladder. You throw it in boiling oil, it swells up like corn sticks. 
They make soup out of it, and a bag like this can cost up to $300. $300 for a bag. This one cost $100. It's bladder soup. They add shiitake mushrooms, chopped crab, and bamboo shoots, quail eggs. Wow, what a soup. And here's pork skin fried in boiling oil. Oh my. Dried bamboo shoots, marinated goose feet, pork innards, and black chicken. Black chicken is Chinese silky chicken, only with black skin. These are bamboo shoots, and these are salted duck egg yolks. This looks like giant red caviar. This is local Chinese fast food. It's got everything. Here are some lotus seeds. They make porridge out of them. Here's the lotus seed porridge itself. Pickled squid. You can keep it in like this for months. And this is boiled sausage. This office is great. I've been walking past it for 14 years, and these grandpas and grandmas sit here in the same position all the time. What are swallows nests? Swallows make nests by binding wood chips together with saliva. They remove the nests and soak them by removing the splinters with tweezers, leaving the dried saliva. This saliva is then used to make soup. So this is swallow's nest soup. It's a soup made from swallow's saliva. Finger licking good. Look, one more funny thing. It's a dough mixer. Only here, you can use a gearbox from a small car. And you can change gears. And now, I'll show you the most vivid place here. Look. Wow. It is the most picturesque house in Bangkok. Everyone seems to love it. This is where the market workers live. They are simple, working-class people. So they don't care much about appearance. But look, this blue basin covers a ceramic barrel. In the villages, these barrels are used to store rainwater. They use it for stuff like, I don't know, for washing feet, for washing dishes. In the past 14 years I've lived here, I don't remember the water being cut off for more than 30 minutes. And that was like three times. But people who come from villages, they can't live without this barrel. It's in their hearts and minds. So they still find this barrel somewhere in some markets and they bring it because it's their comfort zone. These overhanging trees are called ficus religiosa in Latin, or sacred ficus, or banyan. Under such a tree, Buddha received enlightenment, so it's a sacred tree. You can't cut it down, so if it starts to grow, it grows. In 40 years, it will start to break the structure, but nevertheless, it'll stay here. It is their spiritual foundation. In the Bangkok markets, you can also buy wonderful toys. Look, this lady here, her name is Noi. It's Thai for baby. She's 70 years old. It was her grandfather that started making these paper mache pigs. A lot of high officials, politicians come here. For example, party leaders, so very famous politicians. And twice they gave these paper mache piggy banks to the royal family. And all the tourist guidebooks for Thai people have these little pigs in them. Any meaning behind them? In China, the pig has always been a symbol of wealth and prosperity. Why? Well, first of all, they are unpretentious. They eat whatever they are given. You can always sell their meat. That's why pigs are a symbol of wealth. They are a religious symbol of wealth. And red is the color of wealth. It's a Chinese tradition. So they make money out of it. They make a lot of money. What is conservatism? I'll tell you. There is a shop that has been selling paraffin lamps and nothing else for 80 years. The royal family goes to the shop. I ask them how they can live on paraffin lamps now, and they say, we have people who, even if their house costs a million dollars, still want a paraffin lamp in the corner. Always ready to use. It's a spiritual thing. That's why the royal family goes to this shop. All the Thai guidebooks recommend it. This is what the Thais... So they're real paraffin lamps that they use. Yes. You see, Thais are conservative and they don't care about the outside of the shop. It's the inside that matters. It's a Buddhist thing. Or look here, this shop is about 100 years old. It's a place where they make seed candy and nugget candy. The royal family came here too. Look, they wanted to build an underground, but they needed to demolish these houses. The Chinese refused and said, you are going to destroy our cultural heritage. They have been protesting since 2010. You can't use police against protesters here. So they made a deal. They bought the land for $150,000 per square meter of land. Everybody knows what Michelin is. There are Michelin plates. 
and there are Michelin stars, one, two, and three, and you have to recertify for Michelin every year. But the Thais have made their own Michelin. If you see a sticker like this one with a smiling chef and a signature, it's that. Well, a chef made his own guide in the 1980s. It's not that famous, but the Thais admire it. It's the Thai Michelin. Well, the so-called Michelin. If you see a green bowl with that signature, it means the most famous Thai chef made their own guide. It's issued once, and then you don't have to recertify for it. So it can be bad, or it can be good. Now it's the year 2566, so they got the title 24 years ago, and they have five Michelin plates. This is what they got the Michelin plate for. The district takes care only of the paper, and this paper is burned and gifts are sent to the dead relatives in the other world. Look, you can send irrigators and teeth. You can send it all to your deceased grandfather. You just burn it and send it to the deceased. Yes, whole districts takes care of it. So you can give all of this stuff to your relatives? They've been doing it for centuries. A hairdryer, a charger. I think this is where they used to get the shoes to resell in the old Russian markets. I remember how they used to get muddy in the rain right away. Airplanes, fans, and now the funniest thing, the infernal bank of the universe. This money is sent in the first nine days after death, because on the ninth day there is a trial. So this is to bribe the judge. To bribe the judge? Yep, in the other world, on the ninth day there's a trial of the soul. This is heavenly money, or bank of the universe. They're used for stuff after the trial. There are even first class heavenly airline tickets. It's a travel package you can send your loved ones on a trip. Look, something more interesting. First class paradise trips and city bank co card. You put your relative's name on it and burn it. The funniest thing, if you don't know what to give, you can buy it all at once. Oh, all in one kit. Right. Anyway, if you believe in all these things, folks, you can send your deceased relative a Dyson hairdryer, the latest iPhone, or they even say somewhere there's a hand sanitizer. What if there's COVID in heaven and your relative is suffering? Here's the most famous noodle shop, the most famous noodle place in Bangkok. It has 1600 reviews on Google. They cook them over an open fire. Yes, it's so interesting. They actually use coal to make it all. There are two options to buy noodles. You buy it this way if you want to eat it here. They serve it this way. But here is the takeaway option. They wrap everything in a bag, put the broth in another bag, and wrap the noodles in paper. You put it all together and you eat incredible noodles. They say they are the best in the world. It's called something like Zongzi. It's Chinese fast food. I forgot its actual name. They'll wrap anything in this sheet. And it's like fast food for $2. It's really quite a lot of food. Look, we have lotus seed porridge. There's ginkgo biloba seeds, the yellow ones, salted duck egg, Chinese sweet pork sausage. This cafe has about 1,600 or 1,700 reviews on Google. It's a great place. They only make one kind of noodle here and have been doing it for 75 years. Okay. I'm going to try the best noodles in the world. Well, in Bangkok. I mean, I haven't eaten a lot of different noodles in my life, but it's just that I find noodles hard to cook badly. Okay, but I probably wouldn't go here specifically for it. What do the experts say? People who try to come here specifically for these noodles. Let's try them both. El caldo es muy. Dulce y Paris compota. The broth is very sweet. And it looks like juice. With your eyes closed, it tastes like sweet juice. Pork juice. Really, it's pork juice. Film this woman before she leaves. She's about to leave. I'm already filming her. This is one of the oldest cafes in Bangkok. And this woman is collecting illegal bets, football bets in particular, and illegal lottery bets. Everything like this is illegal in Thailand. It's a crime, but they're quite tolerant to it. So you can do it here. 
такая точка терпимости. То есть здесь это можно делать. This place opened in 1927. It was a coffee shop for taxi drivers. These were stern men shouting, taxi, cheap taxi. They sat here drinking coffee. There were no women here, only men, so the urinals weren't covered with anything. Is this the urinal? Yes, and it's not covered. You're drinking your coffee, and someone's there doing their thing. Well, it's normal for the Chinese, and the name of the coffee has two characters. In Northern Chinese, it reads Yu Sheng, it means beautiful life. And in Southern Chinese, it reads Ya Se, which means bowl full of life. Life is good. Yes, life is good. And this is their coffee storage place, isn't it? There are sacks of coffee. The owners themselves don't talk about it, but locals say they started investing in different kinds of businesses. As a result, now in its fourth generation, the family is said to own up to 10% of Thailand's exports. It's not for nothing that the Prime Minister, the Mayor of Bangkok, the Royal Family, and all the generals pass through here. This is the third generation of coffee shop owners. This is her husband. They say he was the ground commander. This is the middle princess, the nation's favorite. This is the mayor of Bangkok. This is the prime minister of the country. And this is the son of this lady. So this is the fourth generation of owners. And this is said to be a local crime boss. What do they order here? Coffee. Thai coffee is roasted very strong, to the extreme. And then it's not ground, it's crushed. Then this crumb is poured into a sock-shaped strainer. And what comes out is its coffee. That is, the coffee is brewed there. They put a cup under this coffee. They have another very strange coffee. I'll show you in a moment. What is this? This is authentic Thai coffee. Absolutely Thai style. Then there is a strong coffee without milk. I call it energizing coffee. It's the same coffee only with ice. This is Thai tea. It's orange. It's fermented a little bit differently. And this is a very strong coffee with green Fanta. And the same with red Fanta. Can I not try that? Have at least a teaspoon of each. I seem to have offended Anton. As he says, we are now going to have the Thai coffee. He said, he knows my infinite respect for coffee, how much I like it, that I choose coffee shops carefully. But he said, we are going to go on a Thai coffee shop where, firstly, they pee right in the middle of the room. And secondly, they make really wild coffee. Without taking the spoon out of the cup, I apologize in advance to the aesthetics. Well, it's not coffee, it's a drink made from coffee beans. It's not just dark roast, it's like ash, a very bitter coffee, like tar. You can't drink it. Anyway, coffee is as old as this place. Try the coffee with the red Fanta. Coffee with the red Fanta. Yuck, I thought. The first one was bad. And now the one with green Fanta. No, I won't drink it. Have a coffee with nothing in it. This is not coffee. Anton, why do you hate me so much? What have I done to you? Ilya Alexandrovich, where are you going? To the toilet. The main thing is not to fall. It smells like a train. Like it used to smell on trains. On Moscow Tashkent trains. On the last day of the journey. And there's a tap there. Yes. Ilya Alexandrovich, how do you feel? Have you washed your hands? I remember traveling on trains like this as a child. What's missing here is tobacco smoke and the smell of mint paste. Then it would be like trains in Russia. Urine, mint paste, and cigarette smoke. It seemed like each. You also need a slight hint of smoked chicken. These days they make pot noodles. Traveling by train as a child, these things didn't exist. So there was a special smell of travelers on the trains. Now as we can see, that smell is also here. How does it feel? Great! If you buy a guidebook for Europeans, there will be beautiful museums, palaces, and restaurants. And in the Thai guidebooks, there are shops with paraffin lamps and noodle cafes where we ate. It's in all the Thai guidebooks. It's probably the most famous in Thailand. I like the way we left, leaving cameras, phones, and everything else on the table. They don't steal here.
The Chinese are well established in Bangkok. There are even special places here for those who haven't learned Thai. Tell me about this place. It's a 10-story car park. The 10th floor is just a roof, so you can't put cars there. And two hectares of land can't lose its value for nothing. The Chinese are very practical. They made cafes for Chinese elders. But they're not just elders. They are dissidents who fled the Cultural Revolution because they were smart. They would have been killed in China. They fled to Taiwan, Thailand, Hong Kong, Macau, and Malaysia. They were well accepted in these countries because they were intelligent. They have been doing business here for a long time. They have settled. They have great lives. But not all of them know Thai well, like the Russians in Brighton Beach. A lot of elders want to live like they did in China. That's why there was that tradition. There were those cafes where the ladies sit and entertain them. The men are 85, the women are 65. They sing karaoke, drink tea. There is massage too. Of course, with so many Chinese, there is also a Chinese cemetery in Bangkok. I was in an abandoned cemetery. I couldn't figure out why it was abandoned. I asked many people, but nobody answered me. But imagine, it's almost 15 to 20 hectares of vacant land in the center of the city. And little by little, they started to unearth these graves. This car park appeared here within the last 10 years. I remember that about five to six years ago, there were still graves here. As for the Chinese, there is no death. Only the shell dies and the consciousness is reborn. Building a sports field in the cemetery is not a problem. Here are the happy people doing sports, training. <laughs> They are all Chinese tombs, aren't they? Yes, here are tombs of 140 years. The newest ones are about 60 years old. Ah, that's where the workers live. Well, they're homeless people who come here to work. They just don't have a place to live. They live in an excavated grave. This is what an excavated grave looks like. They've removed the earth and taken out the bones. It's not too bad. It's actually incredible. You walk through a park, an ordinary park, and there are hundreds of graves, and that doesn't stop people from playing sports, singing karaoke, and having fun. The graves are almost all abandoned, covered with weeds. There are some that are cared for, somewhere there are flowers, but most of the tombs are abandoned and gradually deteriorating. This is the park of culture, recreation, and cemetery. We will all end up here, I was in Bangkok for Songkran, the Thai New Year. It is celebrated from the 13th to the 15th of April and is considered a Buddhist family holiday. Buddhists do not cook the goose or decorate the tree, but they do water the Buddha statues with rose petals. You mean, you don't have to attack anyone and flood them? No, but you have to make a donation. If you have a religious need, give money. The Thai New Year, called Songkran, transition in Sanskrit, means the transition from heat to rains. Everything happens in the temples. Water is poured on hands. Buddha is watered. Hands are washed. Parents' feet are washed. There is also something like this. They can put white clay on your face so that you are clean in the new year. Without all this witchcraft with water battles. I'm the coolest and most handsome at this party. You need glasses because the guys here have strong water guns and you can hurt your eyes. And here they recharge all the water guns with cold water. Yes, the water has to be cold, so they put ice in it. By the way, the refill costs 10 baht. People make good money out of it. This is where the children bathe in the barrels. Here you can buy a gun. 
What can I say? It's all endless fun. You have to understand that the parties are not citywide, but local. But if you move around the city, without participating, you might get attacked and splashed at the most unsuspected moment. So, Driver, you poor thing. Three hours later. In Thailand, even the process of crossing the street can be festive. We have something interesting here. They have these flags near the crossing. What for? It says here, a flag to cross the road. Retired people, people who are afraid or can't cross the street quickly, use these flags to cross the street, to tell everybody to stop. And the flag has thank you written on it. When you cross the street, you leave the flag. People carry them from one side to the other. Wow, they're everywhere. You'll never go to bed without knowing one more thing. I couldn't imagine such urban wonders. Bangkok's Chinatown borders the European quarter. The difference is obvious, even though the Chinese live here. Couldn't we've had a coffee here? Ilya, you'll get a regular coffee somewhere else. We drink the real thing. I swear Anton hates me for some reason. See this house half a meter wide and getting wider and wider? It's a normal thing in Chinatown. The streets here are clean, European style. Even though four generations have lived here without Europeans, there must be a genetic memory. Well, it's clean, it's nice. It's a small version of Chinatown. If you walk more, you'll see that it's only clean here. This house is still habitable, and here, half of the house has been relocated because a tree has grown on this house. It's starting to take it down. This was the entrance, and the tree is sacred. It's a banyan tree. It's easy to identify it by the tails on the leaves. I have a dried leaf of this tree on my motorbike under the seat. You can recognize it immediately by the tail. The ties will know it. A policeman stops me and asks me for my documents. I take out my documents, but I show him the banyan leaf and tell him that this tree protects me. It's a Buddha tree. He asks me how I know, and I tell him that I've lived here for half my life, and there is no problem. Thai electricians. Ah, electricians. This tree can't be cut down either. It's sacred. You have to pray to the spirits of the tree. It's obligatory. But here's this dress, and you can't wear it. It's a ritual dress. It serves to improve family relations, and it's placed under the tree. It costs $20. It is just pieces of cloth stapled together. It's been here for eight years, but the hook broke, and it's going to fall apart eventually. Here, look, the tree started growing in this house. It's dry now, but it was bigger. This is also the banyan tree. And so, that it wouldn't break the house and keep growing, they made this construction. I think it cost $10,000. It's called religiosity. Sometimes it is possible to cut down a tree if it threatens life. They call special shamans. They negotiate with the spirits of the tree. How much and what to sacrifice. And then the tree can be cut down. It happens in rare cases. The tree must really be a threat to life. Tell me about this house. There are 50 haunted houses in Bangkok. If they detect ghosts, voices, then they invite shamans. These shamans meditate, talk to the ghosts who say, for example, well, give us 150 pig heads. They go to the market, buy 150 pig heads, place them on trays, stick incense in each head, make other donations and hold ceremonies. The spirits receive an offering, and in two hours the heads are returned to the market. If no agreement is reached with the spirits, the houses are abandoned. Perhaps a stronger shaman should be summoned. 
And now look, if the houses here are ancestral, the previous generation should have solved this problem. But it didn't work. The house has been abandoned for over 40 years. There are about 50 such houses in Bangkok. In Bangkok, houses come with shops on the ground floor, and people live on the other floors. Here they fix motorbikes. People live upstairs. Here they make noodles, and people live here too. And one section is empty. Why? There are ghosts. Isn't it scary to be a neighbor of a ghost? And he said, it's not my house, I don't care. It's also a sacred ficus. Look how it knocked the house down. Now for some reason they are restoring it a bit. There are props on it, so it won't collapse. I think some shaman went back to negotiate with the spirits. Now look how rich this house is. It was a very rich Chinese house. Wow, yeah. So the sacred trees destroy houses? Yes. And here also, look how the tree breaks the brick wall. My neighbors, for example. I live in a very simple, proletarian house. And I had neighbors who fried rice with fish sauce at home, and it really stank a lot. The landlady couldn't do anything, because they weren't violating anything. And I had rented this room a few years before them, and my friends from Laos came to visit me and slept here, they said, look, we think there are ghosts living there, we can't live in this room. One day I said to my neighbors, is it okay? Don't you hear voices? They tensed up. No. I told them, I rented this room before you, but I left because my friends told me about ghosts. They said, it's nothing, it's nothing. But I could see by their faces that it wasn't. They got nervous. Three days later they left. In Bangkok there is a Portuguese quarter. The Portuguese are no longer there, but there is a beautiful church and curious post boxes. Thais are very practical people. That's why I love them. They are incredibly practical. And when they have leftover pipes when building a house, they don't throw them away, they make mailboxes. I mean, even if there's a normal letterbox, there's still a pipe underneath. The problem is the postman. The postman doesn't want to put letters here. He's used to putting them in the pipe. Here's something interesting. White district. No drugs. A few years ago, they did stats on the number of drug addicts and assigned colors to each district. This district had the lowest number of arrests. They write the name of the police station, the name of the chief, the coat of arms of the police, of the Ministry of Justice of Bangkok. And now, these badges must be clearly visible. There are also, I think, red and black signs, which means the districts are worse. You can't remove them, so the locals started to cover the signs with linoleum rolls, because they are embarrassed. So people are proud of it. There are no drugs here. Yes, there are less of them. Good, let's give them a good luck present. They're going to have a neighborhood with pipes, no drugs, and my face. About 5% of Bangkok's inhabitants are Muslims, so there are mosques here too. A Malaysian businessman used to live here. This was his home. Malaysia is a British country, so it's a British-style house. And before he died, he said it would become a mosque. Now it's a mosque, but before it was just a mansion. Behind it is a Muslim cemetery in the center of Chinatown. Someone is preparing to pray. Many of the graves aren't even marked, as they should be in a cemetery. It's still active. There are new graves. Bangkok is 240 years old. These houses are about 220. There's the tallest building in Thailand and the Millennium Hilton Hotel. They are the oldest stone houses in Bangkok, after the Royal Palace, of course. The oldest stone house in Bangkok has a five meter swimming pool for diver training inside. Today, they've decided to make a small Thai-style boat market, but generally, this is where divers are trained. Here are photos of this house. This is another sacred tree. Look how many ribbons are wrapped around it. In some European cities, they like to stick advertisements on poles. Berlin, for example. And over time, these poles get wider, so no one removes the advertisements. Only then do men come and literally saw off an entire layer of these posters from a Berlin pole. And here it's the same with the trees, the sacred trees with the spirits. People pray to the spirits, see? They wrap the trees with ribbons, and there's a huge layer of ribbons. 
Further on, we see a warehouse. Seven or eight years ago, it was a very dirty warehouse with car parts. It reeked of oil. Later, I don't know how, hipsters started flocking to the area, and it turned into some kind of trendy vintage hotspot. And all these warehouses are now all sorts of cafes, installations. There are a lot of art installations. There are festivals. This is one of the most famous restaurants right now. It's beautiful. It's great. We've seen animals dismantled into pieces, but in Chinatown, they also dismantle cars. Look how beautiful it is. Look at the order, everything in its place. The bra is drying in front of all this junk and wires. A crazy woman with her cats. Well, there are crazy cat lovers everywhere. Now look, they made a shrine in this car, just with supermarket coffee cans. Religiousness. Look, even amongst all this rubbish, everything is perfectly tidy here. The altar is always clean. It's at the top. The altar for the spirits of the earth is also clean. Everything is perfect. Look here. This is the altar for the spirits of this area, the altar of the ancestors. This is the place to burn the messages to the relatives. This woman here is 70 years old. Her grandfather started the shop with levers, and she's been painting levers all her life. Is there an altar upstairs too? Yes, here's a Thai king. Here are the famous Thai monks. We'll continue exploring Bangkok. The Indian Quarter is next. This is the place I really like. To the left is Chinatown. To the right, the Indian Quarter. The Chinese are very practical people. They say, why bother with exterior decoration and painting the house? In six months, it will be all muddy again. The humidity is about 80%. That's why they only have houses like boxes. In contrast, the Indian Quarter is more colorful. I really like the building. Three families live here. The house is four stories high, three meters wide, and every inch of floor is occupied. They live vertically, meaning a vertical section is one family. This house is a symbol of Chinatown. There's more neo-colonialism in the Indian Quarter. So they looked at the Europeans, at all the different decorations, and said, we're going to do it the same way. They just forgot the proportions. It is clear that the Indian Quarter is more colorful. Is that a monitor lizard? It's a monitor lizard, yes, only it's small. It should be up to two meters long. There are many in this canal if you go a bit further. The locals throw dead dogs and cats there. They are nature's janitors. They are scavengers. By the way, their name is one of the worst swear words in Chinese. You could get your head bashed in for it. And this sign tells us parking or riding a motorcycle on the pavements is a violation of law 17-2, or you'll be fined 5,000 baht. They started to enforce it when the military took power. The city has cleaned up a bit. This place was a mess about five years ago. Why is he driving on the sidewalk? He's a taxi driver. He's excused. Oh, that's nice. Like in Japan, they only have it here. In general, they have problems. Thais, as I've said before, they accept everything. So no matter what nation you're from, do what you want, as long as it's useful, and don't get in anyone's way. They don't like Hindus because Hindus, if a Hindu talks to you, he has cheated you. You haven't realized it yet. If he looks at you, he's thinking of how to cheat you. He's always trying to cheat you. That's what the Thais say. If you see a Hindu and a snake, kill the Hindu first. He's more dangerous. They don't like them, but nevertheless, all of Thai culture is totally Indian. Here's one of the most famous Indian restaurants called Tony's. It's inexpensive. Here's Tony. And here are many Japanese walking around here. In Bangkok, if the Japanese come to a place, it means it's good. They are connoisseurs of food. That is, they are experts. That's right. Let's cross the street. And look, nobody honks at us. In Bangkok, after Bangladesh, it's a surprise. Here, they don't usually bother people. They try not to, in general. What a fantastic religion. Do whatever you want as long as you don't bother anyone. 
and achieve total enlightenment. Important advice, friends. Here's a Buddhist neighborhood. Naturally, there are a lot of swastikas. It has to be in the other direction. And there are different types. Look how beautiful it is. It's a Sikh temple. Talking about Sikhs, there are two types of Sikhs. Some with a white turban and others with a turban of any other color. Those in the white turban are Sikhs who had not 10 gurus, but 16. They have no death date for Guru 13. He is now 200 years old. They believe he lives somewhere in the forests of Siberia. If you see yellow flags like this in Bangkok, it means vegan food, yellow and red. It's meat and egg-free. This is for those people who say, I don't eat anything, I don't eat gluten, I'll have coffee with plant milk. Were you trying to offend me? No, it's just a joke. <laughs> Do they themselves eat meat? Every day. Do you eat meat outside of work? We don't eat. Not at all? You too? They like it. They eat meat at home. And do you eat meat at home? I don't. Why don't you eat meat? Does your religion not allow it? Because I was taught that eating meat is wrong. And this is a fabric market. The whole area is a fabric market. As for security in Bangkok, sometimes I work as an interpreter for the police. I started just for statistics. Tourist robberies happen once a month, but without serious injuries. You can get hit on the head, you can get cut with a knife, but it's once a month. There are 10 million people in the city. Most are pickpockets, prostitutes, who spike drinks with chloroform, women who have their bags snatched, they walk along the curb holding their bag. A motorbike goes by, snatches the bag, and the taxi drivers take tourists to shops where they are scammed by Indians, like buying a suit or an expensive dinner. So in all these cases, it's the person's fault, apart from the theft. So Bangkok is really such a safe city that sometimes I can hardly believe it. Let's smarten up. How much did those trousers cost? 160 baht. Trousers for 160 baht. Fancy trousers. Very comfortable. For walking in the Thai heat. They say people fall in love with these trousers. So much that they can't live without them afterwards. Now we go to the flower market. The Thais, if you delve into their religion, are not Buddhists, but Hindus. But you have to study the philosophy here. I'll tell you in a second. Let's go to Thai Sapanput, to the other side. 40 baht, 40 baht. Let's go. Thais are Hindus. If you speak to cultured Thais, they tell you their culture is Hindu. Buddhism arrived much later, about 800 years ago. The king is named Rama related to the god Rama, and all their festivals are Hindu. The Thai New Year's Eve with watering and all is a Hindu festival. Thailand's emblem features the Garuda bird, and Bangkok's the god Indra. They are Hindu gods on the main altars. And Buddhism, I believe, is simply a moral teaching on how to behave. Peasants, the less educated, don't have time for philosophy. They just need to be told how to live what's allowed and what's not. So, cultured Thais say they are Hindus, and the uneducated say they are Buddhists. They believe in spirits. Even in this tuk-tuk, spirits dwell in the vehicle, and you have to greet them in the morning with flowers. Spirits live in the car, the boat, the bank. The bank manager won't open up until the spirits have been greeted. And they believe in the teachings of Buddha, who said there are no gods nor spirits. They have three religions in a single mind, completely 100%. It's not that one person is Buddhist and another Hindu. Look, on the left is the god Brahma, the protector of the world. In the middle is Buddha, who said that there are no gods and that you need to develop your consciousness. On the right is an altar for ancestral spirits, totally incompatible concepts. According to unofficial sources, there are 10 million people in Bangkok. Every morning, everyone must placate the spirits of the workplace. 
These are the flowers given to the workplace spirits. Without this, work does not begin. That means six million bouquets are needed each morning. The flower market takes care of this. It's open 24 hours a day. In Bangkok, there are three places open 24 hours. The flower market, the meat market, and the fruit market. Then we'll look at the statistics of how many bouquets are given to women. There are about 10 shops throughout the whole market. Cannabis, the Happy Gardener Market. Marijuana has been legalized since November 9th, and I can buy one for my plantation? It's marijuana, right? In Thai, instead of ganja, they say kancha. In Bangkok, the flower market is something extraordinary. In Russia or Europe, you buy flowers in shops for yourself or to give to your girlfriend. In Bangkok, almost all flowers are for the spirits. The flowers are given to the spirits, so all these bouquets, compositions, garlands, wreaths are bought to greet them. See, they sell flowers and make their own spirits happy. They make sure to put red Fanta in it. They have an 80%. There's a story. Not sure if it's accurate, but here's a legend in the newspapers. They say in the 90s, the Coca-Cola company made red Fanta and nobody bought it because Fanta was supposed to be orange. The marketers got it wrong. Then employees went to the village to talk with the mayors, offering them 1,000 baht to say that the spirits like the color red. Today, 80% of red Fanta ends up on the altars of spirits. These are official numbers. It's placed every morning and taken down at night. They only drink about 20% of it. Let's ask him why he put a red Fanta there. Why did you put a red Fanta there? You have a red Fanta. Why? Each person believes in a different color. Red is very visible and also brings good luck. They say there's a popular belief to put red Fanta, as it brings more luck than Coca-Cola or the usual orange Fanta. It's called religious marketing, senseless and merciless, to sell rubbish in bulk. You must convince the spirits, ah, the people. You have to convince them that the spirits need it. Spirits like people get bored with the same thing. They might get tired of receiving flowers every time. There are gifts made especially for them. Burmese cigars and cigarettes. Sweets for the elephant-headed god Ganesha. Fruit sets are placed in the morning and thrown away at night. Patel is chewed in many Asian countries. It has an effect like strong coffee. You can offer black candles and black rice for the demon Rahu. It brings wealth and business success. Popcorn is also something interesting. They have these bugs called golden bugs in Thai. People place an aquarium by the cash register or on the store counter, and the bugs eat the popcorn. They also place fruit for the bugs. These insects multiply rapidly, indicating swift monetary and gold inflow. So, when you see ties with aquariums filled with bugs and popcorn, that's their amulet. When the bugs grow, they give half to a friend and make more popcorn bugs, so the rest can multiply further. They have their own trends. The bug fad faded about three years ago. If I were the spirits, I'd assist these people who create such wonderful decorations. Does a bouquet like this cost 12 baht? Wow, such beauty for 50 cents. Less, 35 cents, incredible. A huge bouquet for 70 baht, it's heavy. For $2 you can buy 1.5 kilos of orchids. Incredible. Anton says here you can buy bouquets for women, but they prefer gold, clothes and money. Women are more realistic than spirits. The market extends 150 meters this way, 200 meters that way. The flower market's area is nearly two football fields. It's in the city center and about a 10-minute walk to the royal palace. There are stores with flowers for women. One, two, three, four, five, six, ten stores in the entire market sell flowers for women, as we are accustomed to. That's less than one percent. Now that I've bought the pants and flowers, I'm ready for a date. First, we need to buy an amulet. So let's head to the amulet market. It's the largest amulet market in Bangkok.
It operates just like the flower market. There's an amulet for every occasion. For example, are you a designer, tired at work, bored with everything? There's an amulet for a designer, tired of their work. There are amulets for poker players and stockbrokers, amulets for health, for sports. In short, amulets for everything. We need an amulet for YouTube. Great, let's go. If you lack vitality and have lost the fire in your eyes, there's a lava amulet. A swastika made of lava. This is made from coconut. This is the demon Rahu. You can't see its face well. It swallows the sun and moon, responsible for solar and lunar eclipses. They offer it black incense sticks, black lemonade. It brings a lot of money. Each monastery has its amulets, and sometimes they can cost tens of millions of baht. It's a huge business. Muslims carry surahs from the Quran, and here on a lead plate, prayers are inscribed. You hang this pipe on your belt. These are the enlightened monks. They are allowed to smoke, so the holy monks may be seen with a cigarette. Look, here no one touches the animals because, again, it's a matter of religion. It could be your grandfather or your grandmother reborn as a cat. What is that? It's a woman, the pregnant woman. Inside is holy oil, like holy water in Russian churches. Monks used to draw protective writings and wear them under chainmail to protect against knives, spears, and the like. To this day, some special forces still use these. When you sweat, it all breaks down, and you have to purchase it again. So they began transferring the letters to the body with tattoos. This led to the Thai's shamanistic tattoo, Sakyant, which Angelina Jolie has. Many tourists now visit shamans to receive these tattoos. This man was a 19th century Chinese gangster who controlled opium dens and gambling houses. When he began to make a lot of money, he invested in roads and hospitals. He became a sponsor, he became a deity, and there's a separate altar for him. Anyone involved in the stock market or poker, there's the all-seeing eye, luck, scoring, and gold. These are protective knives, they're most likely made from boar bone. These knives are always marked with a protective layer in ancient Khmer. It's not about physical protection, but spiritual. This knife is made from a wild boar's jawbone. Since the boar is a strong animal, the knife cuts through all troubles and misfortunes. Here too, there's a protective prayer. There's the most neutral amulet you can give to anyone. If you're unsure of what to give a friend, give this. The saint closes his eyes. Frapita, an amulet against all misfortunes. It's priced at about 40 baht. Let's find amulets for YouTube. Hello. Hello, how are you? Help us. My friend is a YouTube star. Do you know what YouTube is? Uh-huh. My friend is popular and wants to grow his channel. Does he want to be popular? Yes, he wants a lot of subscribers. What can you offer him? Many subscribers. I've given him a complicated task. He says that to get more people to watch your videos, as Thai people understand it, you have to be more eloquent. An eloquence amulet would be good for you. Now he will think about it, and he also recommends you an amulet with this bird. It's a symbol of Thai paganism. It sings very beautifully, and it will help you with eloquence. It's a hornet hung to attract customers and improve business. A snake eater that lives in the souls of people who do not believe in the sacred. It comes from Hindu mythology. Here's an amulet against haters. Yes, an amulet against haters. It's a sinhalayan. It gives strength and boldness. It helps with everything you do. And this is a kind of voodoo doll. Sometimes they put nails in it. It's for your charisma. So you've got some ideas for your YouTube channel. And this red-eyed amulet is from Cambodia. It's very old. It's like the Russian jester Petrushka. A buffoon, a cynic who makes fun of everybody. It's to bring your life to a very high level. To make you rest, get money, work. They put vodka, sweets, and used sanitary napkins on the altar. Imagine that. That's the way it should be. It's religion. Here you don't ask why. If a religion says so, it's the right thing to do. You can't think about religion. 
Amulets are not the end of magic in Thailand. Here, for example, there is a very unusual ritual before a funeral. Any temple has a fund to help people who cannot afford to bury a deceased relative. They give money for the cremation and for the coffin. To prepare the process, they need to collect donations, and this is how they solve the issue. They made a plaster skeleton. It says it collects donations for coffins for the poor. Donations are put into the coffin. If you don't need amulets, you can choose meat. There is a night meat market. There is so much meat here that I feel like becoming a vegan. Pigtail, lots of stalls, plenty of everything. And there are the toads. Where? Toads. It's a symbol of gluttony. It's a crisis of overproduction. I asked how much meat is left after sales. They told me they know exactly how much they sell per day, and at what time, and that there is less than 2% left. The market works at night, it's almost 1 o'clock in the morning, and it's crowded. With chickens, pigs, fish, and cows cut into pieces. The stalls are full so people can stock up in the evening. Delicious Thai food in their cafes and restaurants in the morning. There are some rats running around though. They are bigger than chickens. A chicken for 150 baht, 100 baht, 90 baht. Live birds are in cages like this. Be careful here, they are illegal. Cover your phone with your hand. They are pumping water into the chickens to make the bodies heavier. There's even a market in a Bangkok train station. It's in a train station, and there are special free trains for farmers returning to their villagers. The train leaves around 4.30, and so that people don't get bored waiting, for those who don't want to take taxis, they have set up mini bars near the station. Where are the bars? Here. Here in the street? Yes, a woman comes here with a bucket. It's very interesting and curious. She has everything you need in her buckets. Here? See a bucket? Ah, yes. That's why I call it a walking bar. So, there's people sitting here waiting for their trains, and people who know the place come here to spend time. Originally, it was made for the peasants waiting for their train, and they just sit on the pavement. But they pay the station agents $100 for all of them. They get together and pay once a month. They're given the opportunity to make an honest living. Wow! We have beef jerky, green papaya, green mango, bananas, and this is a kind of aubergine. They put it in a mortar, add green beans, coconut sugar, fish sauce, and grind it all together. And this is dried meat. And then people sit there drinking and waiting for the train. In Bangkok, not only food and animals are traded, but also people. Prostitution is illegal in Thailand, but that doesn't mean it's not flourishing. I don't see where the Japanese are. Here on the right, look, the Japanese. The bosses are talking to them. The girls are on the other side. Where are the girls? On the right. Are they wearing black shirts? Yes, and the Japanese are talking to their bosses. The girls are quiet. When the boss makes a deal, the girls will raise their hand, but only those who don't have a job yet. All of them need to have a job. The boss determines which girl is suitable for whom, so that everyone has a client. I mean, all the people outside the supermarket, they're girls and bosses. The older ones are the bosses, in a red dress, for example. Be very careful when filming this. The Japanese have just arrived by plane. Some even come with suitcases. Prostitutes are abundant, even in the most touristy areas of Bangkok. Next to the royal palace, here sex is sold, like fast food. So it's a touristy thing. Yes, I want to show you something in contrast. Let's cross the road and see the most interesting things. Greens. Greens. 
Here they sell grasshoppers, crickets, bamboo larvae. They live in the bamboo plants. What else do we have? Grasshoppers again, various species of crickets, mulberry silkworms, fried frogs and water bugs. See, they don't eat these things or scorpions, but they do eat spiders and water bugs. What are you going to eat? Water bugs. There are old prostitutes sitting further away. Their clients are taxi drivers and truck drivers. That's why there are many taxis there. These prostitutes always carry bags. Here they are, one, two, some older, some younger, but all over 50. All these prostitutes for taxi drivers? Yes. Are they wearing black shirts? Yes. And the Japanese are talking to their bosses. These weirdos are selling drugs. The men are selling drugs? What kind of drugs? Cheap meth. Methamphetamines. Is it illegal? Yes. What's the sentence? 20 years in prison. Here he is on a scooter. Is he selling? I suspect he is. Myanmar used to produce opium. They still do, but you have to grow it. It could be a failed crop. It's easier with the lab. They get everything from Myanmar. Now the biggest percentage of drug addicts are small workers. They melt this pill, smoke it, and then work for two days. And now there is an epidemic of drug addiction. We're going in now. There's an old prostitute sitting there, to the right. Where is she? That one, with the bag. She can't be. 100%. It's a granny. This is the old prostitute's area. I don't think so. Let's move on. What's that? This is where the oldest prostitute sits. You know her, don't you? She's over there. She's the oldest prostitute in Bangkok. How old is she? How old are you? And does she work? My friend asks if you are still working. Yes, I am still working. My family is poor and we have no food. Do you have many cats? How many? I have about 10 cats. Do you have customers now? No. Is it because of your age? Yes, I am old now. It's hard for me to find clients now. How many clients do you have a week? About two people. How much for one hour or one day? One hour costs 300 baht. How many years have you been working? I have been working here since, since I was 39 years old. I came from another province. Where from? The province of Korat. Koratsima. What did you do before you were 39? I used to work as a seamstress in Babai, in the textile department of the Babai market. Why do women of many years come here? It's easier to find customers here. If you come to Kayusan Road, there are many beautiful girls. There are also transvestites. Their beauty is incomparable. How old are the women who work here? The women have been here for more than 10 to 30 years. Most of the women here are over 50, aren't they? Yes, they are. In Thailand, do girls work as prostitutes from the age of 20 or 15? They start at an early age, between 19 and 20. Their clients are usually Thai, right? Cambodians. There are also clients from Myanmar. There were French, Americans. They like Asian women. Don't forget to wear a mask. This is for you. Thank you. They only gave food to her. A lot of people here know her. Have you had Russian clients? No, never. I've had French. So this is where the cheapest prostitutes are. The older ones. Yes. Do all the ones with bags work? 
Here you can rent a chair for the night for 20 baht. This is so girls working here are comfortable waiting for clients. And the girls themselves stand outside the shops with bags. And the bag is a symbol? Yes, an unspoken one. Now we go to the street leading to the royal palace. And you'll see what happens here. It's fun out there. It's cool in there. It's pretty cool there. Bangkok style fun. We're entering the most extravagant area. A massage here costs 100 baht. Is he a masseur? Is this where they give massages? Right next to the stinking canal, it says massage. Why does it stink so much? Yes, it really smells like a toilet here. That's where they rummage in the trash. Wait, the cat, it's dead. Oh, he's married. The cat is beautiful. The cat feels good. These men search trash and nearby they give massages. It reeks of urine because they pee around here. And there are girls. Here actually near a stinking canal, they give massages right on the street with everything needed, aroma oils, etc. There's even a client lying down. There are also clients here. Want a massage, hands, feet? What's the problem? Is there bad massages here? Well, it stinks here. Ah, wait, are all these people masseurs on both sides of the street? And who are the main clients? Taxi and truck drivers, I see. Yes, they shout, massage, massage, wow. However, you can go to a proper salon for tourists and book a one-hour foot and neck massage for 1,000 baht or get a massage for 100 baht. But on the street and by the stinking urine-smelling river, because people don't go far to do what they need to do, save 10 times more, I don't know. If there's no difference, why pay more? See, they're sitting on mats. No, those are bums. Oh, those are bums. People live here. There's the main theater, the main university, the royal palace, the ministry of justice. So underneath the Kremlin walls, they give massages for 100 baht. Yes, 200 meters away. I asked the local police why they allowed it. In 1973, many students were shot here because they wanted to start a revolution. Communism was already flourishing and Thailand was afraid of communists and strongly opposed them. They didn't want to let the communists get close. The king realized that an uproar would occur and when he made what is called a call to the nation to build a self-sufficient nation that would provide for itself according to its minimum needs. With this, the authorities demonstrate they are giving everyone the chance to earn an honest living. Even these people are making an honest living, so nobody throws them out of the palace walls. It's kind of populism. That's what the local police told me. Friends, the sex market in Thailand is not limited to prostitutes, of course. Adult shows are very popular here. For example, those where girls put small animals inside them. But because of animal rights activists, the industry is now suffering. A mouse? How can there be no mouse? Ask him. Is there a ping pong show with mice? Birds? Yes, there is. Really? Yes. There's also a snake show. He says there is. He's lying. What else is there? A frog show. With frogs? Yes. Hello, hello. I want to see a ping pong show with a frog. With this too? Well, maybe after that. Are you also going to this show? Yes, let's go. We want to see the frog show. With frogs? Yes, there's no such thing here. He told me so. There's only ping pong and sliced banana. He lied to us, promised us things. There are no more shows with fish, only eel now. And he claims there are. No, that's not good. We're going to a live show. Let's go. It's just a scam. In 
Bangkok, even the slums are very unusual. Bangkok slums are a curious phenomenon, not like in Mumbai or Pakistan. They emerged when people from villages came here to make money. In Thailand, social classes don't interact. Each stays within their class and that's it. When people come to work in the city, they bring their village with them. So to speak, their life here is similar to their life in the villages. Yes, these people aren't marginalized or anything. They're just ordinary workers accustomed to their life. Look how much laundry is trying. It's quite normal. They're clean, not marginalized or dangerous. It's simply their way of life. There are three main areas of work. Work at the commercial port because companies are there. The meat production industry, and it's the biggest market. And they also sell drugs, cheap methamphetamine brought in from Burma. And workers fry their brains with it. Sadly, five to seven years ago, even taxi drivers started using it. So sometimes, no, always I get into a taxi and look into the driver's eyes. If he has red glassy eyes, I get out and pick another car. That's all. Though Thailand is known for sexual entertainment, all this is illegal. No one talks about it, but not everyone agrees with such a policy. All the high-up officials, the officials I've talked to or tried to interview in Pattaya, as soon as prostitution was mentioned, they all looked at me and said, Oh, no, 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 no comments. Yet prostitution here is so blatant. It exists so openly that we can say Pattaya is the sexual capital of the world. In no other country have I seen so many men and women, transvestites, etc. Nowhere else. What do they say about it here? Soon there will be elections, and here's an election campaign, where these two, presumably women, are promising to legalize adult toys, sex work, and sex creators. They are probably pimps, yes. Tell me what's happening. In Thailand, the topic of sex and prostitution is rather peculiar. Generally, Thais are honest about it. They admit it. Yes, we have it. If we exclude officials and speak with ordinary people, they say, yes, we have prostitution. It's said to be one of the aspects of their Buddhist mindset. They claim to have localized this prostitution. Aha! In Buddhism, do what you want as long as it doesn't bother others. They're given a street where they can do anything they want there, but crossing to the other side of the street is not allowed. Localization. As a result, everyone's content. People work within a single area, and officials continue to ignore the issue, because generally, people aren't troubled by its existence. But society isn't ready for the legalization of this sector at a national, countrywide level. The same goes for marijuana. We must wait, but I see progress. I'm keeping up with the election news. There's progress in this area. That's why, when someone openly states that they're going to legalize sex work, it's the first time I've seen it in my 14 years of living in Thailand. Toys have always been sold in three places. Chinatown, because it has everything, the European district with its red light district, and the Arab quarter, in the Arab quarter, they sell the longest toys and many strap-ons. The Arabs buy them in bulk, literally, and a secret. When talking to transvestites, the prostitutes who have this body part, they've told me their clients are Arabs, Japanese and Koreans. Toys were traditionally sold in these three areas of Bangkok. Everyone knew, but no one said a word. It's the first time this is being spoken about publicly. Thai society is somewhat conservative about this, so this campaign is a huge slap to public opinion. We'll have to wait and see. This man is from the slums of Kalung Toy. He says, it's our home. We'll develop it. And they say in Russia, good elections with interesting candidates. It's an election campaign. Thailand will soon hold elections, and they're promising to legalize toys, sex work, and probably pimps. On the flip side, the same women propose to raise the breakfast, school lunch prices, 
Yes, by 30 baht, to improve the quality. This is how they operate. They target all segments of the audience. On one side are the Thai perverts, on the other, the local conservative society. Choose what appeals to you more and vote for numbers 24 and 9. The same woman who wants to legalize toys and improve food promises free medical checkups every four years. With her, everything will be fine. The sooner you discover something, the easier recovery is. She's taking care of it all. In Bangkok, you can travel and even live on the river canals. And then water will completely replace asphalt roads. Thais have been, in my opinion, non-seafaring their whole lives. They've always lived among the rivers, and there are still people here who fish with spears, meaning many have not adapted to urban pace. They continue to live as if in a village, even though the metro is just 500 meters away. Bangkok has 384 Buddhist monasteries, while all of Russia has 239 Orthodox monasteries. Bangkok has one and a half times more. Here is one of them, and the school is still located within the monastery. These are the most proletarian in houses, where accommodation costs 300 to 400 a month. Directly across, 100 meters away, there's a water village with about 50 houses. They used to be fishing settlements. Now they don't fish, they only farm fish. But still, about 50 houses remain on the water. That means they have electricity, sewage systems, water supply, and they don't dump into the river. To reach the city, they must take a boat, dock near the temple, and walk into town. Thus, they are isolated from the city. To the right are Thai tombs, with entire families buried together. This is how the monastery earns money. And this is a village on the water. They have air cons, boats, and yes, there's sewage. I had engineers who are constructing a wastewater treatment plant in Bangkok. They're Russians, from Novosibirsk. They said that if waste is dumped here, there would be epidemics. That's why regulations here are strict. They should also clean up the trash. It's relatively clean here. We're in the tropics. Water blooms are common. Unfortunately, there's foam. Some people foolishly throw trash into the river. Everyone has their own boat. People still don't grasp that they live in the city. There are fish traps everywhere. Here they build cottages, because for Thais living on water, it's like for a Russian living in a log cabin at a forest's edge, with a real stove. It's something similar. Now they build wooden houses. And the same thing is happening here. All the canals are marked. I went to the post office and found out there's an official boatman postman. Mail is delivered by boat. Even though the metro is just a kilometer away, the black pipe is a water pipe. It's a water purification device, like the artesian water devices in Russia. But here it's ordinary, filtered water. Drunkards live in these colorful houses with nets on the water. See, they keep live fish here, so they have fresh fish for breakfast. And these are the wealthy houses. To the right is a neighborhood of expensive homes. And further down is the home of a man who scavenges through the trash. He's like the Thai version of Plyushkin. I've tried talking to him. Having such a neighbor is quite common. Now, the best part. The monastery here serves the local crematorium, the bell tower. See those cone-shaped lanterns? The lanterns contain graves to utilize the area. The lanterns can hold ashes. The blue house is 40 years old and on stilts. And this house is 80 years old, also on stilts. This house is six years old and the same. They maintain the tradition of building houses like this for years. There have always been two men sitting here drinking beer. I've seen them for over 10 years. It's called stability. Today, there's only one. Usually there are two and always with a beer. A phone booth is on the water, held up by four posts. I've used to call it Russia, actually. There's a beautiful modernist mosque just around the corner. It's the kind of mosque the Malays build. Now look, there's a Chinese settlement on the right, on the styrofoam floating across the river. The Chinese live there. Someone has even built the Tower of Pisa. It's mostly the poor and drunkards that live there.
Hello, hello, all the animals living in monasteries die naturally. It's a novitiate for monks to take care of animals. I've been visiting this monastery for many years. Eight years ago they brought in two small wild boars. Now this boar has become a pig weighing 200 kilos. He's friendly, we can scratch his ear. What does he eat? Monks eat once a day. And whatever is left over in the morning, they must give away or discard. And this guy eats it all. I always bring him chestnuts. He's a gentle boar. Don't be scared. Look, you can scratch him behind the ear. Have you ever done that? See those two bells there? The yellow, the big one, is a normal cast bell. The small one is the head of a high explosive projectile. When the projectiles are decommissioned, the explosives are removed, leaving the head. Made of carbon steel, they're very resonant. That's how bells are made. And the saying goes, let's turn our swords into plowshares. If you liked this video, give a like. Leave a comment and subscribe to my channel, post it on Reddit and send the link to your friends on WhatsApp.